really happy that I'm able to share this vocation. I love, of course, talking about Jesus and about the good things God does for us and how it happened to me because he's got so many choices for us. So, oh, oh Victor. Mm. Victoria, you need to un unmute Victoria. I'm going to um, be sharing my screen so that you can see some of my pictures around my vocation and my life, okay? Um, I always start it with um, this one. I'm gonna share my screen now. Can you see that? Uh, my experience of Jesus is being captured by fire. That's what I call it because I believe he, that's what he really did. Uh, I was a, in high school, I was supposed to do a paper on um, vocation, not on vocation, on something religious. And so I did it on prayer because I thought the nuns would like that. And when I did, I was amazed by God. I was just amazed by the impenetrable love that came over me when I go to pray and I was reading all about it and stuff. And in that, in the midst of that, I feel like I was taken by fire. There's this fire from the heart of Jesus that you feel that really radiates mercy and healing and in ways that I didn't even, my concept of him was gone, different, was very different. Um, I think we all have an idea of what we think Jesus is like, but then when he touches you with that wounded love, it's a whole different level of life and experience of life. That's amazing. So I, uh, and I felt like I entered into that as I began my, my journey with God. Um, I wanna stop sharing for a second. When I, when I began to uh, have these quandaries about what to do about this, I had a spiritual director and she uh, decided that I needed to like discern vocations. And I, she told me about all kinds of stuff. And now I, I felt like I was supposed to work, at that time I was the teacher of special needs kids and I felt like I was supposed to continue to do that. So I said to her, is there anything where you can keep doing what you're doing? And she had me look at um, all kinds of things cause she's my spiritual director. She had me look at, you know, um, orders. And um, then, I was seeing a priest in confession one time and he, I said, you know, I feel like there's something else I'm supposed to do, but, and, and I'm really not scared. I just don't know what it is. And then he uh, said, do you know about consecrated virgins? And I was like, which is rare at that time, it was a very rare um, vocation, but I said, no. And so he gave me this article that had been written in Canada's Catholic review. And I felt like, I was like, that's it. That is what I'm supposed to do. How do I know? I don't know. I, I don't know how I know. It's just your heart jumps out <laughs> and she says, go, that's it. And he's got, he's handing you that. He's handing you that um, experience. I'm going to go to the next, I'm going to show you the next thing. So, so he was handing me his heart is what it felt like. And I, I definitely wanted to oblige him on that. Excuse me. That's our therapy dog. Okay. And so um, when I learned about it more, I, I'll show you this one. I picked the vocation and I showed, um, I learned about it and began to um, talk to my family about it. This vocation is a public vocation. It's a vocation that um, God's called everybody to enter into because you are an icon of the church. You're an icon of that bridal love, that intimacy between Jesus and each of us, each of our souls. So um, as I learned about the vocation, I received the vocation. You'll see that my family and friends are there. My, my family is on the right in those little boxes and uh, all kinds of family, <laughs> nieces, nephews, mother, father, sisters, brothers-in-law, sisters-in-law. and um, then, you know, I worked with handicapped kids. There was a handicapped child at my, um, at my uh, ceremony. And I felt touched by love there. I felt that fire again, like, this is Jesus. 
receive him. And he was very, I felt like Jesus was, all of a sudden I felt like this is, it's me. It's me he's calling. It's intimately, uh, solo, uh, singularly me. So I felt a fire by that. Like that fire was very real. I, um, I'm going to stop sharing again. So I, because of that, I felt stirred to do something, of course. And I felt like, uh, well, will be just a good servant as um, teacher. But I, it turns out that um, God had a lot more for me. And that's what he does. He widens your heart, expands your capacity of love. When he does that, when he touches you with that vocation, you notice his hand was a wounded hand. Because even in a woundedness state, we can love as he loved. We can be a fire with love as he is a fire with love. So that was my experience. Um, I'm going to share with you um, again um, how, how I kept that flame alive because um, that's also crucial to being in a consecrated virgin, that you're able to keep your flame alive. And um, my flame was this. My flame was being close to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. So there you have, uh, there we have a picture of my house. Um, and on the right, left here is my chapel. There's a lot of components to be in a consecrated version. There's, um, you have to have your uh, relationship with Mary who changed you to her with the rosary and love. You have the heart of Jesus that keeps you aflame and faithful. And then the liturgy hours so that you can uh, praise and love him with independency with the church. So I have those reminders in my chapel. I have the privilege of having the Blessed Sacrament in my house in Ann Arbor. That's the house on the right in a regular neighborhood. The neighbors know that uh, I'm a consecrated virgin. So it's a, it's a total gift. It's been a total gift to me, um, that blessing from the Lord. I, um, I just believe that God, you know, has intimately more intimately more and 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 it's hard to express something so amazing and so powerful you know um i but i like uh, you know i'll give it i'll continue to give that to god you know his his merciful love for me um i have um it's also the case that i have to um I teach in a different situation in Flint. And because I live in Flint, I, I've asked and got permission from the Servants of God's Love. It's a community, uh, sisters who serve the poor in many different places. And they allow me to stay at their house in that chapel. This is the chapel I pray in and they support me by praying in uh, Liturgy of the Hours every day and, and having kind of communal um, connections. And that's essential that you keep, you guard your heart that way. and. Um, keep keep giving your heart, even in your day in and day out, and and in your conflicts and and in your crosses. When the cross meets you with that fire, grace, Jesus is there holding it, me up, and holding my face to stay focused on Him. And they help me with that, so that's a blessing. That dog is the dog here. I got a dog at the school. This is my school. I feel like Jesus said um, He wanted. Well, this statue was at school, and it was like Jesus was saying, "Help me." Um, let's reach out to your heart and help me with these children. They're poor kids in Flint. There's a lot of poverty there. So um, I have those students in my class. Um, and this is Mary Mother Flint. And it was an icon crafted for our diocese and the bishop blessed it. The bishop blessed it. And it constantly reminds me of how she's very close to the consecrated version of Jesus. And Jesus is, cl we're close to his ministry because we're intimately his and, and, and live in the fire of his love. And, and that fire is supposed to be connected to others. And indeed he helps us do that. This is my last slide. Um, I thought this was an expression of my whole experience of who Jesus is, that his passion of his cross and his passion for me and the intimacy there that's more profound than I've ever known. Every day is amazing. And that is true. I've been a consecrated version for 32 years. And I have always thanked God every day for the, the amazing things he does, just because you're a spouse, you know, but because you know that's what he does for church. And um, he wants to, this is a song that a friend made of us about 
the passion about being belonging to Jesus and the the uh, servants of God's love actually was a song dedicated to them that my friend wrote. But I, I love the refrain. It says, "Claim me as your own." He takes me by fire because it captures me. And um, and he and when he captures you, your heart is free. In that deep intimacy, you're free. You're free even in your woundedness and your sin. And then he widens your widens your your gaze of the earth and your perception of what can happen, what the possibilities are, because he is God until he's in you and you're in him. So you're given love. You're given love to, to you're given that love to love, to give. And that's and that's a powerful experience. It was for me, continues to be every day is deeper and more amazing than you know. It's just once you walk in that intimacy, it's it's there. So that's my sharing on it. I, I'm a principal. I, I work with students in Flint right now. Um, I don't know if I said that before, but um, anyway, now I can. That's my story. <laughs> Feel free to ask whatever you want. Um, and Victoria is going to share with you hers, or if she don't have a dog barking like mine. <laughs> Sorry about Thank that. Thank you, Teresa. You're welcome. I'm gonna. Um, we'll we'll get to your uh, we'll get to questions at the end of our time together, but we'll let Victoria go now. And then Victoria, if you want me to show your video or slides, you just let me know. You don't mind the uh, slides first. The, the video are the, this slide, right? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start it now. Okay. Um, my name is Victoria Selkirk. I'm a consecrated virgin. Uh, I'm fairly new in tradition as uh, compared to Teresa. I've been consecrated for about five years. And just to provide a little bit of a background. So my slides go through, like, of course, my consecration, my consecration. day. I, um, Say specifically about the actual rite itself um, is that for where it's an ancient rite, it's actually one of the most ancient in uh, the entire liturgy of the church. Um, and so some of my photos will reflect some of the elements of the consecration itself. One of the priests that um, I'm amongst, he describes it as a, cr a cross almost between elements of what you would see in an ordination and also in a wedding, which I think um, so things like we prostrate ourselves during the litany of the saints. Uh, one of co the core elements, of course, is the actual conse consecratory prayer, which is where the Holy Spirit is believed to descend upon us. And that is the moment of consecration. And then, of course, we receive the bell and the ring and the liturgy of the hours. Um, so it is symbolic of our mystical marriage to Christ. And um, I'm going to show later on a little bit of uh, a trailer from my consecration day, which goes through the different portions of it um, a little bit more summarily. Um, but in my life, um, the consecration has been a great blessing. This is what I was called to, I know, from a young age um, profession here. I uh, feel called to actually in two different domains in my life. I am, in addition to a consecrated virgin, I'm also a commissioned officer in the military, which has been interesting, um, reconciliation of two different domains. Um, I really believe that my, uh, my, the two domains that I have been called to complement one another uh, perfectly. I'm a healthcare provider in the Navy. Um, and of course, as a naval officer, I'm called to be a war fighter first. This is what we're trained in. And I, I liken it to, it's given me such um, a training and a focus on just thinking about my spirituality and the battlefield of, of faith that we wage in this world to um, reflect the truth and to reflect goodness to a world that is unfortunately losing sense of those things. So just showing some pictures here from some of the things I've been engaged in in my military career. Um, the military, of course, is a tremendous opportunity, not only for just personal growth, um, but also for deepening my faith in Christ, um, fully relying on him in a lot of the circumstances that I've been in. And what you're seeing now is uh, mountain warfare training, which I went through this past year, which really deepened my faith and reliance on God. 
Um, there's so many different uh, Bible verses. I allude to the um, duality of, for me, military life and my spirituality. I mean, there's so many different references to a shield and a buckler or fighting the spiritual battle that I go intuitively together. Um, these pictures here are photos of the priests in my circle of priests. Um, of course, as consecrated, our primary apostolate is praying daily for our priests and bishop. In my case, two different archdiocese military, but I'm also consecrated by the diocese of Fresno. Um, so for me, that primacy of daily prayer for our priests and clergy and offering up um, my trials and my challenges on their behalf is something that I look to um, because of the fact that if you think about it, particularly as a spouse of Christ, we are fully reliant on our clergy to bring our spouse to us. We can't do that for ourselves. So it's by their holy hands that uh, the Eucharist, of course, is confected for us. Um, so what I included here are a lot of different photos of nature. Uh, unfortunately, as an artifact of my military life, I am constantly moving around. I don't own a home, so I don't have the ability to have an in-home chapel. So I find that what I gravitate to is a lot of time outdoors spent in nature where I feel like God is um, most sentiently present to me. Um, so these are demonstrative of just some of the spectacular places in creation that I've been afforded really because of my military career. I've been able to travel. I've lived in Italy for three years. It's, it's afforded me such tremendous opportunities. Um, I liken it when I'm out in nature too. It's like God um, unfurling this canvas in, in front of us and splashing it with color. And then he invites us to be part of that for even just a brief second. It's so powerful. To me and I feel like the intimacy and the unspoken language that I am able to communicate out there with him is something that I can't really mirror in any other domain of my life. So I'm, I'm very uh, grateful for the ability to immerse myself in nature. It's really what rejuvenates and upholds me on a daily basis and allows me to come back to my daily living. So just some places of nature. And I have a dog, clearly, as you can see, <laughs> who accompanies me everywhere. Um, so this last portion, second to last portion, I wanted to include some of our patronesses as consecrated virgins. Um, my main patroness, I have a picture behind me of her, is St. Joan of Arc. Um, she, although she was not formally consecrated under Canon 604, she had pledged a vow of virginity to Christ. And it is the dogma of the church that a lot of her holiness and her ability to enact such powerful mil military strategy actually evolved out of her uncorrupted gift to God. Um, so these are photos from the pilgrimage that I talked to, uh, taught to uh, Dom Remy, France. This is St. Kateri. We just celebrated her feast day this past week. She had also pledged her virginity to Christ. Of course, St. Agnes, whose name means Lamb of Christ. She was martyred um, due to her refusal to marry out of her soul devotion to Christ. And then St. Maria Goretti, we also just celebrated her feast day. Here she's actually um, sending down lilies to the uh, young man who had tried to rape her and who killed her um, subsequently when she refused. And this is St. Catherine of Siena. And I like to call this my family photo section. These are photos of Mary and Jesus. Um, of course, being the exemplar of virginity, we look to her every day for strength and for guidance. And then this last section, Dawn, if you can just pause it, if you don't mind, please. Thank, thank you. Uh, so I, I wanted to just share a little vignette of something that happened to me this week. It's like God is constantly speaking to us and revealing himself to us. And I had something happen this week that really changed my perspective on things. What you were looking, looking at in that photo is a rosary that I've had for the last two decades. Um, it's fallen apart several times over the last few weeks, and for whatever reason, it's the crucifix piece that keeps disappearing, whether it's in the bottom of my bag or I found it on my car floor. Well, when I was actually going into work on Monday, more, uh, Wednesday morning, 
Um, it fell off somewhere between staff parking and into my office. So of course I get to my office, take out my rosary and notice that the crucifix is missing, um, kind of lost it, uh, wound up running out uh, and trying to retrace my steps uh, with like completely disheveled. My skirt was flapping, my ribbons were coming off the rack, uh, total mess, um, found it. It was laying right there by my car door. And um, it really kind of like, uh, underscored for me. I'm thinking, what is God trying to tell me? This is like the, that was the third time that it had disappeared in that week. And I keep finding it, but it's obviously very unnerving and it's annoying as well. I keep sewing it back up and it, obviously my sewing skills are suboptimal. Um, so I went back to my office and thought about it. And to me, it really underscores uh, one of the core things that I know for myself in this vocation, I need to continuously reflect upon. Um, it's underscoring to me how Jesus must feel every single time that I try to manage things on my own um, as a naval officer, as a consecrated virgin, as just independent autonomous individuals. I think sometimes that can get the better of us and we tend to lose the focus on where um, the strength flows from. And so for me, it's like this uh, continuous process of metanoia. Um, I'm having to continuously recognize that I need to rely not only on the people that he gives me, the clergy and the friends and the sisters in the vocation, but I need to rely on him fully for everything. He's the source of all of my strength. Um, it must be pretty frustrating for him when he is you know, running and in pursuit of me as I was through that parking lot, scouring the horizon, looking for me when perhaps I am um, not relying fully on him. So it really underscored to me continuously how I need to think and remind myself whole heart uh, and my whole being. And he's given himself to me in such a vulnerable and such an enrapturing way. And um, how can I not give the entirety of myself back to him every single day and in everything that I'm doing? Um, I need to ask myself every single day, am I in relentless pursuit of him? So it just reaffirmed that to me. And I feel like God, again, um, communicates with us, especially in this vocation in so many unspoken ways that as that intimacy grows with him, um, I, I, I'm learning better how to hear and speak that language myself, if that makes sense. Um, so that was a tremendous blessing. And pre please pray for me that if my crucifix uh, falls off my rosary, find it. that's gonna be my number one uh, goal this afternoon is to sew back on, so. So that was just something that happened this week that really realigned my perspective. And then there's just one more photo in that photo reel, if you don't mind showing it, please. As you can see, I did try to sew it up, but that was obviously a futile event. Uh, so, so much for that. We'll try again. Okay, so this was a text that someone sent me. I don't know uh, if you saw the first part, they, they had said, well, uh, even if you met someone and fell in love, you would still remain a virgin. This was right after I was consecrated, by the way. And I responded back. I think um, people do not realize that when God calls to you in this intimate way, there is really, no turning back. For me, um, I didn't uh, really discuss this in the first part when we went right into the consecration, but I knew from a young age that I was called to this. I did not know that the vocation existed in a formal way. Um, I did not know that there was an actual um, canon 604 that was described this for us, but I did know that I was called and that uh, I was to devote myself fully to Christ. I did not know how that would manifest. So it was confusing for a while, but um, I of course, happened upon the information surrounding uh, consecrated virginity. And I, of course, I knew immediately that's what I was called to. Um, I think what I'm learning, particularly over the last five years as I'm living this out, is that people are not necessarily going to understand. Just like if you're married in a temporal sacramental marriage, people are not going to understand that relationship if they're not in it. And that's okay. What is incumbent on me is educating and also having grace and patience as people learn about the vocation and perhaps um, discern it for them, themselves. Um, I think it's, it's a powerful opportunity to, on behalf of it, 
And uh, for me, I can't imagine living a life other than one that is solely, exclusively, and also indissolubly um, dedicated to him in a way that is so intimate and um, so permanent. Even when we think of sacramental marriage, sacramental marriage is beautiful. It is, uh, of course, one of the most common ways people are called to vocation. It's a sacrament because it's a sign of something that we as consecrated virgins are um, actualizing here on this earth. Um, so it's, it's a scatological. Um, and I, I think it's so amazing when you look at the today, the diversity of a, God has something for each of us. He knows exactly what all to. It's a, it's a journey for us to discover that. Um, so, and my favorite quote, uh, Song of Solomon is, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And when you're, when you're called to this vocation, uh, nothing else will fill except for consecration and marriage to Christ. So that's been my experience. Um, I'm super grateful for it. It is the greatest blessing in my life with my uh, second greatest blessing being uh, the ability to uh, provide military service. And I believe uh, very strongly, um, as exemplified by my role model here, that uh, this, these two callings go very well together and God purposefully envisioned and planned it specifically for me to live it out this way. Thank you, Victoria. Did you want me to show the consecration video of yours? Yes, that would be great. So one other thing I wanted to mention, if, am I still audible? Can you hear me? Sorry, yes. Was the sound not going? No, is there sound going on your side? But we can hear you, Victoria. One other thing I wanted to mention, and I had not mentioned in, this, uh, in the beginning, really a neat how God works in the details, right? He doesn't look, overlook anything. The day we did actually was um, Corpus Christi. So solemnity of Corpus Christi um, is the day that, of course, um, God poured out his body and his blood through the Eucharist to give entirely of himself to me, right? And that is the precise day that he invited me to give the entirety of myself back. So it, it's a very uh, powerful reminder to me that he doesn't overlook a single detail, nor does he withhold any good from us. It was also the vigil of St. Joan of Arc who worked out perfectly in homage of my patroness. Hey, hey. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my
pretty spectacular day and a reminder again of all of our consecrated virgin saints that have gone before uh, and in humility I look to on a daily basis to help me uh, to grow and to live this out in the witness of Jesus Christ in this dispensation of time which I think needs a testimony of virginity uh, and celibacy too uh, but virginity specifically and um, devotion fully unto Christ if that is how you are so called. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so at this point, if you guys are done presenting, which is good time because we are like right on time, um, we will start answering or asking questions. So how about we get you both pinned? Um, pin both of you and wondering the question about motherhood, living out spiritual motherhood that came through. Um, would you both mind just mentioning a thing or two about how you live out that gift of spiritual motherhood as a consecrated virgin? Uh, yes. <laughs> can, can you hear me? Oh, good. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, for me, it was a big deal. It wasn't hard only because my vocation as my advocation as a principal and a teacher is nurturing based. So very uh, physically, in terms of where I go and how I encounter working with children, that was that was a very on the natural realm. But also, um, you become a spiritual mother to people. Um, I happen to be working with poor people, but you also um, not just in their poverty as um, physical poverty and help them provide for them and care for them in the name of Jesus, but also spiritually. Many many times I've had people tell me stuff, they say, well, I haven't ever shared this with anybody, but I'm gonna share it with you because I know you pray, you know? And so there's a sense, you know, like a mother of that security in um, knowing that being connected to Jesus who can make up the difference in our life for er every need, that he'll do that. He'll do that for us. And uh, me knowing it in my own life, confirmed in my own life, I, got, I know God will be that provider for, has been for me and for, will for them, but I become the conduit the person who does that mothering service um, kind of thing, they're giving them a sense of security, a sense of faith in God, a sense that he indeed does and can move, increasing that confidence, which is which are all maternal things. And also being called to be an intercessor for the priest and for um, the church, at one who lifts up praises to Jesus every day is all part of that uh, nurturing uh, charism that God gives us as consecrated virgins, our ability to bring it, bring it, I call it, bring the grace. I have people who, even in the service of God's love, they say, Teresa, if you pray, something happens. <laughs> and that has nothing to do with me, literally nothing, you know, but God just, there's a, there's a, there's a grace 
And I really think it came with the um, a vocation that is in terms of filling the need, caring for others and, and concretely moving the movement of God in, in the particular way he does with consecrated versions to, to nurture the life of the church um, spiritually and then concretely, like I said, with people. So that's my experience. Did you wanna say something, Victoria? Definitely, please. Um, just to kind of piggyback on what Teresa said, I, I find that the opportunities for <laughs> are pretty much limitless, even in the capacity that I'm in now. Um, for me, I would say it primarily manifests in the fact that I mentioned earlier, I'm a healthcare provider. So I'm a registered dietitian and uh, just caring for people in an apostolate of uh, mercy and healing. Um, participating in their healing and really pouring out my nurturing on my patients, the people that I care for on a daily basis, um, for me, really, uh, in many ways, allows me to, to develop in that spiritual maternity, uh, as well as what had Ter Teresa had alluded to, the, pr uh, the prayers for our clergy. That is really the centrality uh, for me as well, for spiritual maternity as well. Um, making sure that that forms the primacy of what I'm doing on a daily basis. It is the first thing that I do when I wake up in the morning and then I pray the rosary and then mass. Um, and then of course, liturgy of the hours. So uh, that prayer for our clergy though, especially in this dispensation of time where there's just such spiritual warfare going on, um, it, it is uh, another way that I can manifest that's, that spiritual maternity and praying for them in a special way that uh, as consecrated virgins, we can. Um, yeah. Every patient is called to pray for our clergy in a different way, but uh, in my freedom and, and uh, marriage to Christ, it affords me the ability to pray for them in a special way. And as I said earlier, we are entirely dependent on them and uh, their ability to confect the Eucharist for us, to physically bring them. So um, all I can say is and pray for them every day with, with the warfare that they are fighting. Um, so that's another way that spiritual maternity manifests for me. Nice. Um, there's a lot of questions regarding formation um, and also prayer life. So some of the questions, you know, is there like a standardized formation for cancer virginity, which <laughs> all of us would say, of course, there's not. <laughs> um, but can you give some ideas of like what does happen in regards to formation um, in both of your cases? And age qualifications. Okay. What qualifications a woman must have? Okay. Um, I'll start again. I'm uh, well. I, like I said, I was the first one in Michigan, and so uh, when I talked to Bishop Powers, or when the priest, my spiritual director, went to talk to him, he was like, "Well, we don't have a format for this." And I think what happens across the diocese in the country is that. Oftentimes it, it winds up into the hand of the um, their uh, formation director or their director who's up in the the diocese diocesan offices. And so we use we came together in Michigan as using the um, the consecrated as consecrated virgins and kind of worked on getting the format together to suggest the bishops because really the bishop drives this eventually. And um, but I think for my formation, the first things you want to do is to get into the habits of the life, which is mass, liturgy of hours, and prayer, essential prayer, and uh, which would mean like substantial prayer, not just, uh, and, and of course the rosary, but I'm teen, talking about intimate still prayer before Jesus, and uh, preferably before the, tab before the um, like an adoration, um, so that your heart stays joined to him. And I think as that, <clears throat> you pick up that temple and those intimate experiences of prayer life and then interceding for the church, I think uh, you, you, you feel that grace. It kind of becomes more concrete part of who you are. And, <clears throat> and there's a confirmation in your spirit too. Oh God, how God wants that to happen. But I, the best thing that happened to me was as more sisters got consecrated and as we met them across the country and across the world, the fellowship, making sure if there's a consecrated virgin in your area that you dial them up, <clears throat> ask, the, ask your office of life, consecrated life and see if they can hook you up with those persons. So go into the uh, 
the United States Association of Consecrated Virgin has a website. You can go in there and say, hey, ask the question, and they might, they'll probably have somebody who's in your city to, to spend some regular times with them to talk about the life, how your prayer life's going, how, how it's working out, literacy that was how to segue life in the world, which is secularized and sexualized with life with Jesus, which is totally radically, amazingly good and different and fun because he does things and shows up and blesses you and, you know, makes miracles happen with people's lives, you know, because you're a witness, you become a witness. So, but, um, I think those are the formation things that uh, how I experienced it and then subsequently how I do it. Cause now I, I help people and, um, we always start with those things, just living the life first and then getting conversations with other kinds of versions. Did you want to add anything to that, Victoria, that was different than what Teresa said? A couple of things, just quickly. Um, so same thing in terms of my formation. I was the first one in my diocese as well. There was no formal formation process in place. I worked with my vicar for women religious for a year in terms of getting, as uh, Teresa had described, just kind of the daily uh, orarium down, of the flow of the day. Those are the basics. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to underscore, though, and I think sometimes there are different ideologies about this is that this really is a vocation of being not necessarily doing we are called to be spouses to Christ and of course the doing flows from the fruit the fruits of that flow from the love that we have for Christ but the cent central uh, notion of this vocation is our love for Christ and I think sometimes at a high theological level some women get so encumbered with the thoughts of well I need to have all of this theological training and I need to have a the degree in theology and I need to uh, you know check a million different boxes off and at the at the core of this is a call to love Christ in the most intimate way that you're giving your entire self of him uh, yourself of to him so I think um the vocation, the formation should, of course, be the basics, but it make it so um, uh, encumbering with so many different requirements that it becomes something that women cannot achieve who are truly called to this. Remember our mother Mary, she did not have a million theological degrees, a million certifications. Uh, she was still called to love Christ in the most radical way to bring him forth to us. So that's one thing I just wanted to make a point of as different dioceses are figuring out how to do the formative process to not encumber it so much that it becomes as un, um, unattainable. Nice, thank you. So we're getting short on our time. There'll, there'll be more time at the end of the day to ask questions of the discerners hour. Um, but a question that keeps coming up that people are like, please answer, please. What is the difference between consecrated virginity and like religious life okay and we're not called sisters just so you guys know we're right. we call ourselves sisters like hey sisters but like we're really I mean you don't use a title for us you don't even use right. cv after our names right so right um but people are asking like kind of what's the essential difference between secular institutes and and consecrated virgins um but then also um you know, that discernment of religious life versus consecrated virginity, if you can kind of give like a point each of you about that. I think the first thing, you know, there's like several points, so I won't do them all, I think. Um, but, but the first thing is you're under the bishop and Jesus consecrates you. So you're not taking a vow or, um, you know, like the being like the Franciscus who I was joined to, and then I was joined to the Carmelite, but Really, it's not a spirituality. It's the spirit of the church. And that's why you're praying the liturgy of the hours and, and the church is setting you apart. See, so God, through the church, is setting you apart as his consecrated virgin. So you can't unconsecrate a person. You know, like you can't, like when you, if you're in an order and you discern out, you can discern out, you know, you can go out, but you don't unconsecrate a virgin. That's why they like to wait until you're a little older, you know, um, you know, like close to the 30 before you do something like that. But um, that's the the biggest difference. And of course, like Dawn was saying, you don't have, you don't go by sister or anything. People notice your life, you know, and they go, you're different. And they can feel it because I've had that happen to me. And God's, the charism really does perpetuate without us knowing it in many different ways. But um, it's, and, I, you know, I've had people who've told me about, how impressed they were. They wondered who I was and they knew I was kind of religious-like. 
And then they asked about the vocation. They probably wished they hadn't, because then I was all excited and talking about Jesus. And then I had one girl decide, look, I was, I'm going to get out of my fornication relationship because you can be a virgin. So I'm going to try to at least stay out of my, my stuff. And she, after a year after she, I didn't see her, she came back and said, Teresa, I did it. You know, I'm not hanging out. I'm not living with guys. And I thought that's the anointing that went through her, you know, that grace to live righteously, you know, um, and that's just all part of it. That's different from, I think she would approach me differently if say I had a veil or ring on or um, sometimes God just imbues our living in the church, in the world, but not of the world that there's an anointing grace that goes forward, I think. Shut up. Okay, so we now have a poll for everybody that's on to let us know how this hour has been for you about consecrated virginity. Um, so there's a question for those who are actually discerning and those who are question, a question for those who are just curious about consecrated life. Um, so it should just take you um, a few seconds to enter in your um, answer so that we can just get a snapshot of how you received the information you were given today. Um, and they did this so beautifully. I think Teresa and Victoria both did it in such a different way, which was beautiful too. And I think that's in that part of the beauty is that uh, consecrated virginity is lived out differently for each woman. Um, there's some strains that are, that are the same, of course, like they mentioned prayer life. It's going to be, you have to be praying and connected to Jesus in that particular way um, to have, have to be a consecrated virgin. Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll and then share the results. And it looked like overwhelmingly, <laughs> this was very helpful um, that 77% wanted to know more. The discerners wanted to know more and 74% of those who were curious said that it helped them understand better the, um, this, part of consecrated, consecrated life. So praise God, this is amazing. And we're so thankful uh, for all of you. So thank you so much for uh, joining you. us today. And Dawn is gonna lead now us into some reflection and prayer time. Yeah, and I'm actually sitting here with the Lord in this chapel. It's my chapel in my house. Cool. So I thought I would show you you can see it, the sun's beaming in, so it's hard to see, but there's my tabernacle and um, my little pray do there. And I'm sitting in my little chair. Here. And anyway, um, so we're just gonna have a little time of silent prayer before we get our coffee. And um, I thank Teresa and Victoria for sharing their lives and there'll be more time to, I know there was a lot of questions unanswered. So in the next session at 4 p.m. today, central time, we're gonna have breakout sessions. So you can ask more questions later, but. We're going to say some prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Come, Holy Spirit. Help us settle our hearts and just ponder the mystery of what we just heard from and saw in Teresa's life and Victoria's life as consecrated virgins. We ask you, Lord, to show us anything, um, be it some of the imagery and the pictures and videos that they showed of their lives, um, something about this vocation, again, the, just thinking through the secularity of the vocation in the world, being a bride of Christ first and foremost, praying with our Mother Mary and for our priests, What was it, Lord, that you want us to just rest in and, and ponder more in this moment right now? Come, Holy Spirit.
And Lord, as we go about this day, help us to um, not be bothered by fears that might come up in, in discernment of your will. Take away all fear and help us to just be open in this day to receiving what you want to do. Thank you us various locations to consecrate to be espoused to you. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Kateri Tathawika, pray for us in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.